why did it have to be the snake? Yes, that was a question that came up last Sunday in our St. Paul's Bible study. When I heard it, I couldn't help but chuckle. Maybe if you like Indiana Jones, you're joining me in this squeamishness around the snakes. Perhaps we all get a little unsettled by that particular story. You know, the one where humans get hoodwinked by a serpent who tempts them to eat forbidden fruit. That ancient myth has been one we have been taught to hear as a tale of desire turned deadly. It's a story that parallels other human etiologies that attempt to tell us why the world is like it is. We are made in the image and likeness of God, and we struggle to distinguish evil from good. We are finite creatures who seldom grasp the price of our choices until it's too late. God created us and blessed us with beauty, freedom, and community, and those gracious miracles get complicated through our creaturely restlessness and reaching, often toward the very thing we know will kill us. Yes, since the Garden of Eden, it has been hard to shake those implications that slither around our subconscious, causing probably all of us to feel a bit uneasy. And Nicodemus himself seems to come to this moment with Jesus there in the nighttime, as if he too is unsettled. His personal desire for more, more understanding, more awareness, more of the kingdom of God, just might threaten to undo his very identity. He's an upstanding citizen, a tenure-track law professor who has gotten tenure. He's a teacher of Israel who knows everything that the law says about love. He helps people unpack it and apply it to their lives, and yet Nicodemus feels spiritually restless. He sees the Spirit up to something in Jesus, and he just has to get closer. He wants to see what is there. Maybe it's only in the darkness of night that Nicodemus can face his desire for transformation, awakened little by little to those winds of the Spirit. Some of you might remember that part of my Lenten practice is reading Dr. Catherine Meek's book entitled The Night is Long But Light Comes in the Morning, Meditations on Racial Healing. And in her book, Dr. Meeks writes, to fully embrace a new way to see requires a willingness to allow old ways of seeing to die. Letting go of certainty, our hard-won confidence in knowing what we think we know about life, that is the essential leap of faith that being reborn by the Spirit requires. And most of the time, we fear that kind of surrender. And yet, until we go to that place of spiritual unknowing, there isn't much space for God's fresh possibilities to emerge in our lives. Nicodemus wrestles with that very paradox. He's willing to cultivate curiosity, even tentatively, as he moves towards that deeper desire that is stirring within him. And there, in that tete-a-tete where you can see Jesus' knowledge of the law and Nicodemus, you know, matching wits, Jesus brings up this fascinating point at the heart of their intense conversation. He says, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. It's a soulful dialogue about desire, and there Jesus goes, son of man, son of God, plunging into potent imagery. Amid the water and the wind, the womb and new life, there again is that serpent. Are you too squeamish when you hear Jesus making this analogy about himself? This is not Puzzle Slytherin Harry Potter stuff. 
totality, creation, divinity. Serpents represent transformation and healing. They're linked with the animating force of life in the universe. Whether you look at the Upanishads or other Sanskrit texts, or even Native American mythologies, there is a lot of potent imagery. And we also see this ancient tradition showing up in our lives, too. Think of the rod of Asclepius, that Greek god of medicine, showing up in symbols as ubiquitous as our modern-day physician staff, and in iterations as singular as Berlin's memorial to the murdered Jews of Europe. Somehow we know deep in our bodies that having the things that our, our sins lifted up and looking at them, somehow we know that it's only in so doing that God's power can transform them. So here, in this encounter with a teacher of the law who knew the one Jesus was summoning when he brings up Moses, the one who received the law, it's probably not so strange. Here Jesus, pulling on that potent icon of the snake, bringing up another story from the Hebrew Bible that Nicodemus surely knew, even if it's a little less familiar to most of us. So I'm going to take you through it. Flash forward from that deadly incident in the garden to the wilderness wanderings, episode 21 of the Book of Numbers. There, God's people are facing off with other serpents in this incredible incident where God mercifully transforms their sin. Almost like Jesus is arranging an ironic appointment for us and Nicodemus with the ghost of desert times past. In that season, the spiritual ancestors of all of us had grown sick to death of the manna from heaven that God had given. Miraculous food to sustain them after they had been liberated from slavery in the land of Egypt. And just like tends to happen with human beings, those ancestors of ours grumbled. What is this? We gotta have this again? This is leftovers times weeks upon weeks. They didn't want that anymore. They couldn't see the gift God had given. 
serpent in the wilderness, a sign of love. So must the Son of Man be lifted up, that we might receive this gift of life. So we have this strange tendency to have practices in Lent that we don't do other times of the year. You might have noticed today we read the Decalogue. And yes, I forgot to kneel down at the very beginning, but it's tied to these ways that we have of needing to name what we have to confess and bring into the light so that we can really and truly receive this forgiveness and love that God wants to pour into us as we face the things that we have done and left undone, as we recommit our desires to God's new possibilities, waiting bring us into participating in God's redemption and repair of the world. It's a weird practice. It's a, a paradoxical discipline to look squarely on the ways we fall short and to ask for God's new life to recreate us for fresh possibilities. And this is a practice that doesn't just stop at naming my personal shortcomings. It prods all of us to wrestle with those deeper communal and societal sins that are not easily transformed. Solemn seasons like Lent invite us to remember, every time we say, Amen, Lord, have mercy, that we need the healing light of truth to shine on our human condition. Mercifully, Jesus chose to bear in his own body the whole truth of the world's sin, and to forgive each of us, one and all. That kind of divine kindness lifted up is a healing mystery. The same strange paradox that stirred Nicodemus to reach toward that glimpse of a world recreated and his own place within it completely broken wide open by the generative spirit. That same spirit of love that Later prodded Nicodemus, after he witnessed Jesus lifted up on the cross, to return, to receive Jesus' broken body, to bury the crucified one in a lavish act of tenderness for the Savior, who had given everything for love's sake. Lifted up from the earth, Ascended now into heaven, present in our lives, Jesus steadies us to face even those difficult truths that would send us squirming from the room. Sins like systemic racism and climate catastrophe, these things we inherit from our ancestors with complicated histories, and the suffering that destroys families and communities through the pain of addiction, anxiety, depression, generational trauma, and other human tragedies. God's mercy reaches out to embrace it all. In Jesus, the one who was lifted high to transform our brokenness and birth us to new life that we might bear fruits worthy of repentance. Amen. Lord, have mercy.